So you will have just heard the this meeting is being recorded. Um, I'm uh, David Reed. I'm one of the mechanical and electrical design engineers here at Mesh Energy. Um, today we're talking about a, a solar thermal, uh, so the other solar technology from solar PV, which is um, probably the technology which which more people will be familiar with. I want to introduce Meshwork. So as all of you who are on this will be aware, Meshwork is um, Mesh Energy's little internal social network. Um, it's designed for architects, um, clients, uh, anybody really who's got an interest in renewable technologies of any kind. Um, and it's entirely free to join. And this is where you can view these webinars live. So what we're going to cover today. So first of all, a little bit about mesh energy, then a little piece about the energy hierarchy. Um, so this is the sort of underpinning uh, piece that, that sits behind all our work, really. Um, but it's it's uh, it's very important that everybody really understands the energy hierarchy. Um, and then we're going to go into some of the basics around this particular technology of solar thermal and a couple of terms and definitions. Um, there's only are only literally a couple um, in this one. It's, it's quite a simple technology in some ways. Um, so there's not lots, lots of uh, confusing um, numbers and uh, different things to, to understand. We'll then have a look at the components of the system. So that's the collectors, uh, roof mounting kits, pump stations, cylinders, um, pipes and fittings, the heat transfer fluid and the controls. Um, so that's all the sort of major components that make up a solar thermal system. We'll then talk about uh, some of the sort of external influences. So the effect of azimuth and pitch um, on the output, the effects of geographical location, and also on um, have a look at some of the things to do with the backup heating that goes alongside the solar thermal. So solar thermal on its own won't provide 100% um, of your hot water. So you need something to top that that uh, that hot water up, um, and that's usually a boiler or a heat pump. And finally, um, we'll look at a couple of uh, so basic in integrations. That's final on the technical side. Uh, the basic integrations of domestic hot water. Um, a little bit about how you can use solar thermal with swimming pools, a little bit about maintenance and then warranties. And finally, we'll go through things like planning permission, uh, funding streams, and, uh, and then a little comparison against solar PV. And that really finishes off the investment case. Um, so we're going to talk about a little bit about some of the costs uh, associated with installation as well. And then moving to the very end of the presentation, there'll be some key takeaway points. Um, so these are sort of the key things that, that you should really hopefully take away from this presentation and understand. And then a little bit about um, how mesh fits into that, that sort of whole project planning phase. And then right at the end, we'll, um, there'll be some space for questions. So I'm not going to bore you with this too much. I know um, probably most of the people who are watching this presentation are aware of who Mesh Energy are and what we do. Um, but for anybody who is new, and especially those people who may have discovered us online, um, we are a small independent energy consultancy. We're based in Farnham in Surrey uh, in the UK. Um, we are, um, as I say, independent of... Um, of all sort of manufacturers and technologies. Um, so we, what we try and do is we try and give the best impartial advice we can um, to our clients um, with the aim really of simplifying the energy landscape. Um, there are lots of competing technologies out there um, and some of them work very well in some circumstances and others work very well in other circumstances. There is no one size fits all solution. That leads us quite neatly onto the energy hierarchy, which is summarized in this little, this little graphic here. But really what the energy hierarchy is saying is in essence, do the simple things on your building first before you start putting technology onto the building. And if that's, you know, that's the sort of key takeaway from this is there's no point in taking a really bad building and trying to tech, chuck te technology at it in order to make it good. You know, do the simple things well. So make sure the building's well insulated. Make sure that you've got the ventilation uh, right. Make sure that you're not doing anything silly if you're designing a new building in terms of orientating massive windows due south and then wondering why you've got an overheating issue. 
you know, do all the sensible things, look at things like shading and all the practical passive things you can first, then start applying um, the, the you know, clever technology. It's better from uh, an environmental point of view. It's better from a long-term cost point of view. It's better from a short-term cost point of view. You know, insulation, you know, as a good example, is generally fairly cheap. So if you've got good insulation, that then reduces the size of the heat pump or the um, or the, the uh, heating system you need. That then reduces the capital cost. It also reduces the running cost. Um, so all these things um, have a sort of snowball effect. And that's really what this slide sums up. So here we've got our house. We have insulated it properly. Um, we've put in lots of passive uh, things to improve the building. Um, so this house is now ready um, for the next stage, which is to start applying a few of these clever technologies. So as I say, today we're talking about solar thermal um, and it can be seen as the sort of poor relation of uh, solar PV. Solar PV is obviously the one that's making all the uh, headlines at the moment. Um, it's the, the sort of new kid on the block. Um, and the technology of solar PV is advancing at a massive rate. Um, by contrast, solar thermal is quite an established technology. Um, it's incrementally improving, um, but at a much, much slower rate than solar PV. Um, but that's not to say it can't really give you some fantastic results um, in the right circumstances. Um, as a good example, a good solar thermal collector can be up to 80% efficient, um, whereas even the best solar PV collectors, the really, really high-end ones, um, you're looking at really around about 25% of the very, very highest. Um, so hence, there's, there's some advantages to solar thermal in some circumstances. So what is solar thermal? Well, solar thermal is a mechanical system. So that means that if you don't understand electrics, it's a fantastic system for you because it only has about three electrical parts on it. Um, it captures free energy from the sun. Um, it uh, creates uh, heat and that heat can then be used to generate domestic hot water uh, different ways um, into an existing building um, or into a new build. So there's uh, two definitions I want to just give at the, the, uh, the outset. The first one of which is azimuth. Um, that is literally just what is the angle of the, um, the collector array um, from south. So uh, the absolute ideal in the northern hemisphere where we are is that you'd have your solar panels pointing directly south. Um, solar panels will work if you turn them away from south um, and you can do things like east-west splits you will get a reduction in um, the output of the system as you move away from south. And that is and that angle from south is referred to as the azimuth. And the other thing is the pitch, um, which is the angle um, when measured against horizontal of the panel. Um, so a panel that, because we're, we're going to start getting into a little bit of the technology now, um, and we're going to start at the top of the system with the collectors. So there are two broad types of collectors. Um, the first one of which is a flat plate collector. Um, so these are the ones that look fairly similar to a solar PV panel, um, but they, uh, but the way they work and what they do is completely different. So see, a solar PV panel is generating electricity. This is generating hot water. So inside this panel, you have a, a, a set of tubes, um, which a liquid is going through and the panels are designed to heat up um, and get as hot as they can. That's why they're black, because obviously black absorbs heat um, and light in the most effective way. Um, these are relatively cheap to buy um, in comparison to um, other types of system, um, but they don't give such high efficiencies. Um, a lot of people think they're slightly better looking than evacuated tubes and we'll see evacuated tubes on a number of other slides so you can make your own mind up about that um personally i i think i'd be in the camp of i think a, a flat plate is probably more aesthetically pleasing especially if it's a roof integrated type system um these panels are quite bulky um typically they are about one and a half times the size of a sort of standard pv panel um so they are a lot bigger 
um, that can mean that things like shipping costs and um, and the fact that you need to have you know at least two people to lift them into place on the roof um, can mean that they that they can be a little bit sort of tricky to handle. Um, so it's just something to bear in mind. And especially in the in the sort of uh, where we're fairly far north here, we've got we're fairly high up in latitude. Um, they don't work quite so well as evacuation tubes. Um, and they're also not quite so good if you need um, very high temperatures um, for things like uh, commercial processes or, you know, if you were running a laundrette, for example, and you need lots of hot water, um, then then, it, then evacuated tubes might be a better option. Um, but for most domestic installations, they're perfectly good and um, they, they work very effectively and they're relatively low cost. Evacuated tubes, on the other hand, are probably the... The, they're the higher technology system um, and they perform really well um, in colder or cloudier conditions um, compared to a flat plate collector. Um, so they typically give better performance in the UK, which is both cold and cloudy most of the time, um, although you wouldn't believe it from the weather we've had the last couple of days. Um, they collect heat more evenly throughout the day so with flat plates you tend to get a sort of peak in the middle of the day um, evacuated tubes are more effective at collecting heat um, at the extremes of the day as well as in the middle of the day so they give a slightly more even output and um, they are as I said better for installations that require very high temperatures so industrial and commercial processes typically um, they're also slightly less sensitive to the sun angle and the orientation, um, partly because you can often rotate that if you've got a, a roof where, the, um, where the, the tubes are not pointing due south, you can actually slightly angle the tubes to make them point a little bit more south than you might immediately think. Um, the tubes themselves are made out of quite thin glass, so can be damaged if they're not handled carefully. Um, they're robust enough that they're not going to get broken by things like um, wind and sleet and those and, and hail and those kind of things, um, unless you have a particularly unpleasant hailstorm. Um, but but the individual tubes can be replaced um, if they need to be um, because they they unplug uh, from the sort of manifold at the top. So they they're a good robust system that there's been it, you know it's well tried and tested. It's not a new technology. It's been around for a significant amount of time. So in terms of you make your choice of collector and you obviously now know a little bit about the advantages and disadvantages of each, you then got to work out how you're actually going to apply this to a building typically. Um, and the most common place to put um, solar panels on a building is on the roof. Um, generally, roofs are pretty big. They're not really used for much else other than keeping um, the rain out and keeping the sun out in the summer. Um, keeping a little bit of uh, wind out and stopping the kids complaining um, about uh, being sent to school uh, very cold. So you can use this, this you know, big roof area for generating a bit of hot water uh, for free, which is all very good. So this is the first type of roof system, which is a surface mounted system. So this is where you don't disturb the roof tiles um, and you effectively have hooks that come out from uh, the rafters underneath and you secure the panels onto those um, those hooks and this gives you a system where the the panel sort of sits proud of the roof um, aesthetically it's not as nice as an integrated system which we'll look at at the moment um, but it's probably the most common system for retrofit installations um, because you don't have to really touch the roofing at all so you don't need a roofer um, to come in to um, help with the installation and that keeps the cost down. It's relatively simple to install um, but obviously not as aesthetically pleasing. So the second type of installation which is the most common on a new build is roof integrated. So here the roofing materials are actually stripped away, you create a, an empty area of roof and the panels themselves and the roofing kit that sits behind them create the weathering surface. Now that means that the panels sit pretty much flush with the um, with the roof finish and that gives a, a nicer aesthetic um, but 
they're, it's pretty prohibitively expensive to do on an existing roof unless you're re-roofing anyway for other reasons. So weathering details usually require a roofer um, to integrate them, but you'd usually do this as part of a roofing, uh, a larger roofing project anyway. Um, so they, so that's where, where this comes in. The next sort of popular place, and this is particularly popular in city um, environments where you have, have a lot of flat roof buildings or in commercial environments, because a lot of commercial buildings that have flat roofs, um, is to have a flat roof kit. Now this, this one's quite an extreme one because it's actually orientating the panels at about 40 degrees, the, the ideal angle, um, but you can get ones that are much lower profile. Um, generally people try and uh, fit the panels so that they so they can't be seen from the ground on a flat roof and they're just um, uh, hidden by the balustrade. So it allows the solar collectors to be fitted onto existing or new roofs. Um, one thing I would say is they're usually fitted with a ballasting system, um, which means you don't have to penetrate the roof covering. Obviously, flat roofs are much more... Um, likely to have water sitting on them um, than a pitch roof you know pitch roof the water is designed to run off uh, flat roofs although the water will run away it runs away much more slowly so any penetration through the roof covering is much more prone to leaking um, so hence um, you tend to use a weighted ballasted system rather than a penetrative type fixing um, one thing that, that Bowder, um, who are one of the big flat roofing specialists, um, are always at pains to point out is check the condition of the roof carefully before you start installing um, your solar installation, whether that's PV or solar thermal. Um, because if you put the solar, the solar system on the roof and then realize you need to, to replace the roof, you have to take the whole thing down again in order to replace the roofing. So you might as well do it all in one go while you've got the scaffolding up because it, it's going to save you a hell of a lot of cost. Even if the roof's not quite at the end of its life, it will probably still work out cheaper um, to do that, that order. Um, other things to, to take into consideration is checking roof warranties. Um, sometimes the warranty will require a um, sacrificial layer of membrane over the top where the um, ballasting is going to sit, for example. Um, so it's worth checking what the um, warranty on the flat roof is um, because you don't want expensive leaks. Um, and as I say, collectors are normally set at a sort of 10 to 15 degree pitch. Um, the reason that you'd have the collectors at that angle is so that rainwater will tend to self-clean the collectors. Um, so it will run off the collectors. And that's obviously more relevant to flat plate collectors than it is to evacuated tubes. The other place you can put... Um, Collectors is on the ground, on a ground mounting. Um, this is probably less common with solar thermal than it is with um, solar PV, um, but it does exist. Um, and there's a nice photo of a quite an elegant um, solar thermal installation there with evacuated tubes on a ground mount. Um, this is obviously particularly um, useful for sort of very large domestic where you maybe have a lot of uh, garden and you can hide the uh, panels away a little way from the house. Um, or in commercial installations. Um, it can also be useful if you've got, for example, a listed building and the, the um, conservation officer isn't keen on you putting solar panels on the roof, um, then you might be able to do a ground mount instead. Um, the, the actual mounting kits themselves look relatively similar to flat roof kits, um, but they tend to be um, uh, ground anchored rather than ballasted. Um, simply because there's not the requirement to not penetrate through the roof. It doesn't matter if uh, you leak a little bit of water into the ground um, because that's what it's there for. Um, and of course, being on the ground, you can have a lot more freedom as to which direction you face the panels. Um, so you can really maximize the output. Downsides, well, they can be a bit prone to vandalism. And as I said, evacuated tubes particularly can be a little bit delicate. So um, it may not be the ideal solution if you've got a uh, school full of uh, kids who are going to be kicking footballs at it. So that's the, the sort of first big component dealt with, um, which is the, the collectors and how we're going to mount them onto the roof. We then need to think about how we're going to circulate um, uh, the, the, the heat transfer fluid through those collectors. 
um, and back uh, to where we're going to use that heat. And to do that, we need some sort of pump. And the most common way of doing that is to buy a pre-built um, pump station like the one in photo. So this circulates heat transfer fluid around the system, um, but it also has connections, um, also has the ability to set the flow rate in the system because you can change the speed of the pump. Um, and they sometimes have little balancing valves in it as well. Um, but it also has the connections. Um, if you look on the uh, right hand side here, you've got the connections for filling the system. Um, so that's what that's for. Uh, there, you also have um, a pressure relief valve, um, which would allow for um, some system safety, which is the pressure relief valve is that little thingy up there. And you'd also have um, the flow rate meter, which is that little window there. Um, and what happens is as the flow rate increases, the little float, which you can see there, um, moves up um, along uh, in that chamber. So you can see what the flow, so you can read off what the flow rate is. So that's, so we've got our collectors on the roof. We've got, some sort of pipe work system, which we'll talk about in a moment, connecting the collectors to the pump station. We then need to use that, um, that heat somewhere. And the most common way of doing that is to have a solar cylinder. Um, so this is a cylinder, which is a um, hot water cylinder. Um, so this will have your domestic hot water in it. Um, and the most usual way of doing this is with a twin coil cylinder. Um, you can use two cylinders in series, which is another common way of doing it. Um, and that's probably more frequently used on uh, larger commercial systems um, where just from a packaging point of view, it makes sense to have two smaller cylinders rather than one massive one. Um, but this is probably the most, most common way for a typical domestic installation where uh, footprint is, is quite important. So at the bottom here, we have the um, solar coil, which is this coil here. And that is where the, so the cold water comes into, the, always comes into the bottom of a hot water cylinder and hot water leaves through the top of the cylinder up, up here. So that would be where your taps are. And so your cold water comes in, it immediately meets um, the, solar coil so your solar coil is hopefully getting hot from the heat transfer fluid and that causes the hot, the the cold water to be heated um as you know uh water and air both when they're heated um go down in density a little bit so they will tend to so the the heat will tend to rise any cold um water that's uh, collected at the top of the cylinder will then be forced back down to the bottom so you will always have the coldest water um, in the bottom of the cylinder where it can sit against the solar coil. And that means that you maximize the output from your solar coil. Above that, you then have the coil, which is connected to your boiler or heat pump, which is this coil here. And this coil will be sized, um, depending upon the size of the boiler and the size of the, the, or the size of the heat pump that you are connecting to. Now, this effectively, because of what we said earlier about, about warm, water, uh, warm water rising, is only able to heat the, uh, the area from the bottom of the coil upwards. So this volume here below the top coil is what is referred to as the solar specific volume. So that isn't really useful hot water because you can't guarantee that's going to be hot. So what you'd normally find is you'll you'll specify a larger cylinder um, than you normally would because your effective usable volume is this volume between here and here because that's the bit that the boiler can heat up to make sure that that water is up to full temperature. So you've got your two coils. Um, you'd also quite often have um, some sort of immersion heater, um, which would probably go higher still in the in the cylinder, which is this um, this little debris there. 
and then you'll have various other connections for um, safety valves. Um, so you've got your TMP valve up in the top right hand side here um, and you've got various other um, connections for different things. So hopefully that explains what all the different gubbins on your hot water cylinder are. Um, I think I've been through all those points about the usable cylinder volume and the upper coil um, being used to heat up from the boiler um, and the solar specific volume at the bottom. Excellent. So we've now got sort of probably three quarters of our system. Um, we understand about three quarters of our system. The other crucial parts of this are obviously all the bits that connect it together and control it um, and the actual the actual um, heat transfer fluid that goes through, which is what we're going to look at over the next few slides. And you might think, well, OK, it's um, it's a liquid that is going through a pipe. So how hard can it be? Well, the thing to remember is these pipes could get really, really hot. Um, and we're talking about much, much hotter than the boiling point of water. Um, we're talking, you know, 150 degrees would not be um, out of the question. So we ought to make sure that these pipeworks components are selected to cope with these very high temperatures and the pressures that may be associated with the system. Um, so generally pipes are copper or stainless steel, um, not very thin walled um, copper pipes, um, uh, but usually not plastic because plastic pipes would actually start to melt at that kind of temperature. Um, the insulation um, can be foam rubber or mineral fiber um, or rigid polyurethane. Um, so so the, uh, the insulation shown in this uh, is the uh, is the foam rubber type. Um, and you'll see also you've got an integrated sensor cable um, in in here, which is that little cable there, uh, which just saves you running a se separate sensor cable. Um, and you've also got stainless steel pipes there. Um, the other really important thing when we're talking about pipe work is that the um, pipe work must be joined with compression fittings or brazed with a very high temperature solder. Uh, you cannot use standard solders connections that you might use on your um, normal hot water or cold water circuits. Um, the, the solder will actually start to melt and with the pressure that's inside the system, um, especially on a very, very hot summer's day where you may get something called stagnation, uh, those those um, joints can actually start to fail and you when you get that release of pressure then you can actually get um, a steam coming out of the out of the out of that broken joint so it's really important that you choose um, the correct uh, types of pipe work and fittings um, other components things like the expansion vessel again needs to be solar rated um, because the little membrane that sits in the in the center of this uh, of this expansion vessel um, needs to be able to resist the heat and pipework fixing. So even the, the fixings that, that, that hold the pipework back to the wall, um, obviously most of the time people use plastic fixings, but again, they could start to melt. So we need to start thinking about using metal fixings uh, rather than plastic. So it's just a question that, you know, these are all things that are taught to you. And if you do a BPEC solar course, these are all the sort of things that, uh, that are taught to you, but it's just important to remember um, don't get blase and just you know start chucking in um, normal pipe work and normal fixings because you will start getting some fairly serious issues. And the last part of any system is the actual heat transfer fluid. So you've got to fill this system up with something and um, obviously in the summer it's going to get really really hot and in the winter it's going to get pretty cold um, so you can't just use water um, because the water potentially could freeze in the panel during the winter and start breaking it apart through, um, because obviously ice expands uh, or water expands as it turns into ice um, and you get sort of uh, freeze-thaw um, type situations. Um, so typically you'd use about 40% mix of this polypropylene uh, propylene glycol solution um, and that will protect the panels down to about minus 20 degrees C. So we've now got the mechanical components sorted. Um, what about the electrical side? So we've got to control this somehow. Um, and we've got to know when to run that pump and when to switch it off. 
Um, and it's a surprisingly simple system, really. Um, you have three temperature sensors, uh, sorry, two temperature sensors and a pump output um, in its simplest form. Um, so you would have a sensor up on uh, the solar panel telling you what the solar panel temperature is. So is the solar panel temperature warmer or colder than the cylinder temperature? If it's warmer than the cylinder temperature, then it makes sense to start taking heat from the panel and putting it into the cylinder. Um, you also uh, want to understand um, what the um, uh, temperature in the cylinder is, because obviously once you get up to around uh, 60 degrees Celsius, then you're going to want to start thinking about turning the system off so you don't end up overheating the cylinder. Um, one of the biggest risks, of course, is that is if you had an uncontrolled um, buildup of, of heat in the cylinder, then potentially you could get overpressure situations. Um, now there are safety devices in in place to prevent that type of um, scenario. So you have uh, three levels of protection on any um, G3 cylinder, but uh, it's just worth bearing that in mind. And finally, it will show the system performance. I'm just going to just have a quick check. There's one. Um, are open loop systems still used or they've been phased out and only use closed loop systems? Yes, there are still drain back systems. Um, I'm not going to talk about them in this, so I'm going to concentrate on pressurized systems um, for the sake of simplicity, really. Okay. Right, so I think we've now covered all the components and how they fit together. Um, we'll, we'll look at an integrate, an actual sort of full circuit um, in a little bit more detail, a little bit further down through the presentation. Um, as I talked about earlier, we there is an effect of the azimuth and pitch um, of uh, of the roof, and so the, the direction it is from south, and also the um, the pitch, uh, so the angle. And this uh, little table here shows you roughly what you're going to get um, from the system in terms of um, the actual irradiance. So if you're between 30 and 40 degrees pointing due south, you're going to get 100% of your um, of the available irradiance. As you start moving away from that, um, if the very extremes, um, if you had a vertical panel that was pointing due east or due west, then you'd only get about 50% of the irradiance. So wall mounted panels um, are sometimes sort of mooted as a potential um, solution in, in very uh, heavily space restricted um, locations. But in reality, they're probably not going to be particularly efficient. And so most people uh, will tend to try and stick to roof mounted, even if that means that you have to have a slightly less than ideal angle. You know, even at even at zero degrees, you still get eighty four percent of your output. Um, obviously, as you start increasing um, the angle up to about thirty and forty degrees, then you then you, then it starts rising. So the reason for that is that obviously, optimally, you would have the sunlight coming in absolutely, um, absolutely. Uh, perpendicular to the to the surface of the collector um, but in the real world you know we have to take into account the orientation of the building you know you probably aren't going to put a, a a solar pv installation at some sort of odd angle on a roof um, because it will just look a bit strange um, so you're going to orientate it to the edge of one, one of the edges of the roof or something like that the ideal pitch in the UK is between around 30 and 40 degrees. And uh, the ideal um, angle is due south. Uh, obviously, if you were in the southern hemisphere, um, then the ideal angle would be due north um, because you're obviously the opposite side of the equator. Um, oh, yeah, well, sorry, I missed that point, which is quite an important one. Um, so the thermal, because it doesn't rely on uh, the connection between different um, electrical cells within the panel is less influenced by the effects of um, azimuth and pitch than solar PV is, and it's also less um, prone to issues with shading. Um, so, so it is 
slightly better if you have a um a partially shaded site um, than PV from that point of view. So the other thing obviously that, that affects um, how much light you're going to get onto your solar PV array is the um, uh, is the is where you are in the country. So here's a map of the UK and it just gives you the irradiance um, at different points in the UK. So you can see down in the southwest um, you get pretty high irradiance that really maintains all the way through across to sort of Dorset and Hampshire kind of area. But then as you go, as you go north, then it starts dropping away. Uh, you'll see that you get these slight sort of um, coastal patches and things. Um, that's because you get these localized effects where you get slight, tend to get slightly less cloud um, on coastal locations than you do inland. Um, and mountainous areas you'll see tend to have slightly lower radiance because mountainous areas tend to get slightly more cloud. Um, but as I said, solar thermal is a little bit less affected by partial shading than solar PV, so it can be a good thing from that point of view. So we've talked about the sort of what's going into the lower coil on our dual coil cylinder. On the upper coil, you're going to be connecting something else. And in most cases, uh, that is going to be um, a... Um, a heat pump or a um, or a boiler. Um, system boilers are compatible with solar thermal. Um, so if you've got a system boiler, you've got an existing domestic hot water cylinder, you are going to be able to put in some sort of solar thermal installation. Um, if you've got a combi boiler, then you're going to need to check with the manufacturer. So that's a, a boiler where you don't have a cylinder in the house. Uh, you will need to check the, the manufacturer. Some combi boilers will accept preheated water from solar thermal. Um, other um, combi boilers won't, um, so it's just it's just worth checking. Air source and ground source heat pumps work much the same as a system boiler from that point of view, um, so are compatible with solar thermal. So here is our very simple um, solar PV integration. Um, we can pretty much ignore uh, all the bits that are uh, on the right hand side here because that's all to do with space heating so we can ignore all that um, and that doesn't really matter what we're really bothered about is what's over here on the right hand side um, so you can see starting from our our collector here at the top we've got warm uh, the warm uh, uh, heat transfer fluid coming out you'll see that it goes into the top of the coil um, comes out the top of the panel again because of uh, the uh, warm uh, because of the natural convection effects so the warmest um, fluid will tend to collect at the top of the panel and because the warmest water will be at the top of the cylinder you obviously want to try and transfer from warm to warm and slightly cooler to cooler water at the bottom of the coil so that's why it's piped that way around you go up through your pump station. Uh, you have isolation valves either side of the pump of the pump, so you can change the pump if you need to. Uh, you've got a little temperature um, thermometer there. Uh, you've got your safety system here, so that's your um, pressure relief valve and your expansion vessel there, and a little pressure gauge. And then you're coming up into the collector. So that's the sort of solar thermal side of it. And then on the boiler side, um, so in this case, we have got a boiler, but a heat pump would be very, very similar. You've got a flow and return um, with a little pump just circulating um, water around the coil. Um, you'll see there's a non-return valve there, um, which is simply to um, prevent any kind of siphonage type situations. So obviously you've got the water and antifreeze mix. Um, it's pumped through the collector and then it gets heated by the sun. That's then transferred through the high efficiency coil in the solar cylinder um, into the heating, into the um, domestic hot water. And um, the heat pump or boiler is just used to top up the hot water temperature if it's needed. In the summer, you may not need to up, uh, use the boiler at all. Or what you can do is you can use the boiler um, intermittently um, just to, to make sure the water is up to temperature for peak periods. And that's the most efficient way of running a solar thermal system um, is to leave the boiler operation until um, the evening time 
uh, where you maybe want to have a sh make sure your showers are up to temperature uh, because that way you have the maximum volume of cool, cool water in your cylinder for the solar thermal to heat. Swimming pools, are a fantastic situ situation uh, for solar thermal. Again, we've got the, um, the, the panels on the roof there, evacuated tube panels, and they um, work in a very similar way uh, to, this, to a system on domestic hot water. Um, they're especially good um, if you've got an outdoor pool, um, which is used only uh, seasonally, um, because obviously the times when you're going to get the most sun is probably when you're going to want to use the pool. Um, and you can also connect the same panels into a domestic hot water system. So, um, so you can use it to heat your domestic hot water. Um, the two of them work quite well together. Uh, on very hot days, then you'll obviously get the heat from the panels to heat the domestic hot water up to, you know, typically you want 60 degrees C maybe in your hot water. Um, but for a swimming pool, you maybe only want 28, 29 degrees. Um, so you can, um, so on slightly cooler days, you'll still get something useful um, from your solar thermal system for the pool. What about maintenance? Um, something people always, you know, often isn't considered with with systems is that they will need maintaining so what's the maintenance regime like for a solar thermal installation well the good news is it doesn't take a huge amount of maintenance um but really you know annual or, or biannual inspection is probably um ideal uh, so you'd just check the system for leaks um one good thing is that the um the glycol solution that, that goes around the, the solar thermal system does have quite a strong smell um, so if you do have um, a leak, you're likely to smell it. Uh, you need to keep the panels clean to maintain performance. Uh, check the pressurization of the system and the expansion vessel and the operation of all the safety devices. You know, just make sure that um, that uh, the uh, pressure relief valves and things are still in operation. And uh, check the condition of the heat transfer fluid. It does break down over time, so it needs changing every few years. Um, it costs around about £100 um, to change that heat transfer fluid. Um, some of the eagle-eyed among you will probably have recognised that this, um, this photo doesn't comply with any kind of health and safety standards. Um, but luckily, there is a health and safety officer stood in the background there um, watching him uh, about to fall to his death. Right, so they brought, in terms of warranties, um, each of the components would have their own warranty. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about them and also about the installation warranty. So first of all, collectors, um, they would typically have a lifetime expectancy of 20 years um, or maybe a little bit more. Um, it's not unheard of for collectors to last about 30 years, um, but you'd expect to have a warranty of around 10. Uh, pump stations, two to three years. Uh, cylinders around about 25 years against um, uh, against manufacturing defects and um, there's not a huge amount that can go wrong with cylinders you may need to replace um, a TMP valve or a pressure relief valve every now and again um, and finally installation um, a good installer should warranty their work for between two and five years um, depending on uh, what you agree with them so that's kind of taken us through the technical part um, now we've got a little bit more about the, the sort of red tape and, and all the bits that go along with that. And we're going to start with planning permission. Um, I have got another couple of slides which are hidden in this presentation that talk a bit more detail about the planning permissions you need to put a um, solar thermal array on the roof. Um, but in most cases, it, um, solar thermal installations on a roof are, un, uh, are covered by permitted development. Um, and that also applies to solar PV installations as well. Uh, there are some caveats around um, conservation areas and uh, listed buildings and those kind of things. So you just need to be a little bit careful. Um, ground mounted arrays generally require planning permission. You can do some things under permitted development, but if we're you know, generalizing, um, generally, if you're putting it on a roof, you're probably going to not need planning permission. Generally, if you're putting it on the ground, you probably will need planning permission. Um, there's a lot more information on the planning portal. Um, you know, it's free to free to access. Um, so 
there, 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 I say there are a couple of hidden slides in here, which I can share with you um, afterwards, uh, which go into a little bit more detail on exactly when you do and do, don't need planning permission. Then we're going to talk a little bit about domestic RHI. So this is the government paying you money for your solar um, thermal installation. Uh, one thing you'll remember if you went to the uh, solar PV masterclass is that solar PV doesn't uh, qualify for the domestic RHI. Um, so that is one advantage of solar thermal over um, solar PV. Uh, so you can get up to £2,100 towards the cost of installation. Um, that's paid over a seven year period. Um, and the exact amount will depend upon the size of the installation. Um, but currently payments are made at a rate of 21.49 pence per kilowatt hour uh, for new entrants into that scheme. Um, those prices are due for review at the end of this month. So they will no doubt change a little bit. Um, installation costs. I'm not going to give you a, this is a, you know, how long is a piece of string type um, uh, answer to this. You know, it will be, it will depend um, upon the installation, but it will depend on the size of the installation, the type of collector specified, as I said, flat plate collectors, slightly less efficient, tend to be a little bit cheaper than evacuated tubes. Um, the roof mounting system required, obviously um, integrated systems may be a little bit more expensive. Ground mounting systems where you're looking at foundations, etc., may be more expensive. Um, scaffolding costs, obviously high rise buildings are likely to incur more scaffolding cost. Um, any structural upgrades that are required, obviously these, these systems do have a weight associated with them. Um, so it may be that you have to do some structural upgrades. Um, so it's worth checking with the structural engineer, especially if you've got a slightly older building um, that the roof will take the weight. Uh, the complexity of the uh, collector layout, um, obviously more complex collector layouts might be more difficult to install and will take longer and therefore cost a little bit more. The complexity of the pipe runs. Um, again, you know, if you've got a very straightforward pipe run back to the uh, hot water cylinder, that's likely to be cheaper than if you've got a very convoluted route. And then there's other factors, um, you know, site specific factors that uh, I can't go into in this presentation. But that gives you a rough idea of the kind of things that an installer might be considering um, when they're trying to cost your installation for you. Um, and maybe, you know, gives you an idea of, you know, the kinds of questions you might want to ask an installer when, they're, when they give you the price. So if we look at the investment case, um, Typically, a family's domestic hot water consumption will make up around about on a brand new build property, um, 30 to 50 percent of their total energy bill. Then um, so the other big chunk of that is made up of space heating, um, which obviously th solar thermal doesn't really contribute towards. Um, but the solar thermal system itself can give you about 30 to 50 percent of that um, of that domestic hot water. So you could be looking as much as 25 percent of your total um, energy bill um, being wiped out by a really well designed solar thermal system. It's important, however, to avoid dramatically oversizing the system um, because you can then get issues with stagnation um, because the, 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 the heat has to go somewhere and you, um, once the system stagnates, you have to wait for it to cool down before you can start using it again. And I'm not going to go into too much detail with that, but it's just, just something to bear in mind. But equally, undersizing a system dramatically um, will, uh, will not benefit you either um, because the, the, the fixed cost of installation are still there. Um, so things like the scaffolding are still there. Um, so you're not going you, to, you're not going to realize the full benefit of the system. Um, and you're still going to have a lot of those fixed costs of installation. So I guess this is the burning question is, is I've got a roof. Do I put solar thermal or solar PV on that roof? And the answer to that is in one word, most of the time, you'll probably find that solar PV gives a better economic return than solar thermal. However, there are some situations where solar thermal is going to be the better option. So the advantage of solar thermal is it's a relatively simple system. 
Um, so it is a simpler system than solar PV. There's very little in the way of electronics in it. So it's um, so it's you know simple and reliable from that point of view. It is more space efficient. Um, the the collectors themselves are more efficient in gathering um, light and turning that into energy. But obviously they only turn it into thermal energy. And if you haven't got a use for that thermal energy, there's nothing you can do with it. Um, it's brilliant if you've got very high hot water demands. Or if you've, for example, got a swimming pool where you've got a large dump of heat. Um, so it can be really good for offsetting the high cost of swimming pool heating. And of course, the other advantage is it is eligible for domestic RHI funding. So from that point of view, it's a positive. Um, although you still obviously have to find the capital up front um, in order to benefit from that domestic RHI funding. So counterbalancing that, we've got some disadvantages. So you are limited to production for heating. Um, so that's usually domestic hot water heating, could be swimming pool heating as well. Um, but once that's been, been satisfied, there is nothing else you can do with it. So any excess generation is just wasted. You, you, it's not like you can sell um, the hot water back to the grid uh, like you can with excess PV. Um, so from that point of view, it's, it's got that inbuilt um, potential for wastage. Um, some of the components will have a shorter lifespan than, than solar PV components, although the actual panels themselves are very reliable, um, pump stations and, um, and some of the other components uh, will need replacing. So it's just worth bearing in mind, pump stations themselves aren't particularly expensive, but you have to drain the system down and then, um, and then, and then refill. And so there's, there's the labor cost associated with that. Um, they do have the potential to freeze, um, so um so you can in uh, certain situations um end up with an issue of freezing obviously if you use the uh, correct concentration of the um heat transfer fluid then you shouldn't get any issues of freezing um and also obviously you can't oversize the system so with a pv system you can chuck loads of pv panels on and although it's not the economically the best way of doing it um you won't end up with any problems from oversizing a PV system. It's just maybe not going to give you the best payback. Okay. So that's uh, about five, two now. So I've got a little bit of time, hopefully at the end for questions, but we'll just run through the top things. So stick to that um, uh, energy hierarchy that we talked about right at the start, really um, important. Consider your likely domestic hot water consumption um throughout the year on a day-to-day -day basis because that's going to help you size the system um how can you optimize the azimuth and pitch so you know get get the best out of the system um and have you got any shading issues that you need to deal with um how are you going to maintain access for uh, maintenance of the panels pump stations and ciliary equipment you don't really want to be able to put the scaffolding up every time you want to um uh, go and clean your panels if they're under trees for example where they get covered in leaves um Consider the type of collector and the layout and how that might affect the appearance of the building. Um, obviously, uh, planning permission issues may come into, into that as well. Um, consider how you're going to look after the system and monitor it and maintain it. And finally, um, if you've only got a fixed roof space, um, consider whether solar PV might be a better option for you. And finally, domestic RHI, um, yeah, remember the government might pay you to, to fit this system. So, um, so you know, if you are going to do it, make sure you use an MCS accredited installer, um, MCS accredited products, and that way you will um, stand to benefit from domestic RHI. It's a couple of thousand quid, it's, it's worth doing. So how does Mesh get involved in this? Well, we got from stage one, feasibility, um, this the feasibility study is really where the, probably they do the bulk of work on solar thermal um, and we basically do an economic comparison against solar PV. Um, most buildings will have some sort of um, limitation on roof space that's available for solar um, or some sort of capital cost um, uh, limitation. Um, so it may well be that that we give you an idea of what the uh, the best situate the best solution is. Um, obviously, it will have an implication on SAP calc, so we can get involved there. Then we can specify a whole system for you at stage four. Um, 
oversee the um, installation and uh, and the tendering process at stages five and six. And finally, we can do post occupancy evaluation um, through things like energy monitoring, etc. Uh, there's a list of the upcoming webinars um, next couple of weeks. Uh, I've got, I think, three or four weeks off now before I do another one. Uh, but next week, um, I think it's Richard talking about uh, delivering Reba 2030. Um, it would be well worth a listen. He's, uh, he's very interesting to, uh, to, to listen to on that subject. And finally, we've got time for questions. So if you have got any questions, please feel free to type them into the chat box. I can see I've got a few... Um, uh a few here so uh glenn asks can you integrate solar thermal with underfloor heating systems or is it only uh or is it only feasible for um i'm guessing he means uh, to, uh for uh domestic hot water um so space heating with solar thermal is quite an interesting one um generally speaking they don't align particularly well because you get very little from solar thermal in the winter um so as a rule of thumb, I would say domestic hot water is the way to go because when you're getting a decent output from your uh, solar thermal, you're probably not going to want your underfloor heating on, um, especially in a, in a relatively well insulated building. Uh, Said asks, what's the output you can achieve from a standard panel? Um, it's not quite measured in the same way. Um, but as a, a rule of thumb, if you've got a, um, if you allow one panel for every two people um, that's uh, that's in the house, uh, that tends to be a fairly good sort of starting point. Um, then James asks, um, can solar PV used as a brief soleil um, with permitted development? Uh, honestly, I would need to go and check that. Um, I think that you would find that you would need to have um that you would need to have planning permission because i think there's a limitation on how far the panel can stick out from the building without having planning permission um of i think 200 millimeters so um so that's um Patrick asks, uh, what is typical for a roof mount system? Uh, does the roof require reinforcing or strengthening in order to accept a, a solar thermal array? Uh, so uh, in most cases, um, you will not need to reinforce the roof um, for a solar thermal array. Uh, it is occasionally required, particularly in very old buildings um, where maybe the roof timbers aren't quite as strong as they, as they um, maybe were when they were installed. But in most cases, you'd be able to put a, um, a surface mounted system on without having to, to do anything about structurally reinforcing the roof. Um, if any of you went to the Spirit Energy um, PV webinar last week, um, they gave actually quite an interesting insight where they said that they've had a few projects where they've used an integrated uh, roof system uh, for retrofit PV installations uh, because the um, because you've been, they've been able to remove tiles, which is saved weight off the roof, and then replace those tiles with with solar panels, um, which then gives the weathering surface. So the overall weight of the system has actually decreased slightly because obviously tiles are quite dense, um, and that's and that's allowed them to get around the loading issues that they had um, without actually having to structurally do anything to the roof. Um, but in most cases, um, you'll be absolutely fine. With no further questions, thank you very much for attending the webinar and I hope to see you at the next one. If you've got any inquiries, please drop us a line through the contact details on the screen.